Hello, team, and welcome to Bureaucracy. I am your host, Emily Gross, and I'm so excited today because we have a very cool scientist, intellectual human being named Noah Diffenbaugh, and he's going to be talking to us all about climate change because this was recorded on April 23rd, which means yesterday was Earth Day, and recently, at the beginning of April, the IPCC came out with this new ruling about how we're kind of like fucked. Anyways, Noah, why don't you introduce yourself, and then we're going to talk all about global warming and climate change. Sure. Uh, my name is Noah Diffenbaugh. Um, I'm a professor and senior fellow at Stanford University. I'm a climate scientist, and I study global warming and climate change. Cool. I also did some research on you, because I would not be a good host if I didn't Google my people. And apparently, you also worked on the IPCC once upon a time. Once upon a time, yeah. So the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's actually the it's a UN um, it's a UN body. So that the actual IPCC are the actual governments, right? And the authors of the reports are volunteers, right? Volunteer expert authors. So I was one of a few hundred lead authors on uh, the last round of reports. Uh, so there are a lot of IPCC reports, actually, and the main reports happen uh, every six years or so. And there's three working groups, working group one, working group two, and working group three. So uh, relatively straightforward names for the working groups. Um, yeah, I was like, they couldn't have given us a little bit something more special. Yeah, well, so so uh, working group one uh, is focused on what they call the physical science basis, and that's basically the causes of climate change. What is the evidence for climate change historically, uh, and what is the evidence for where um, climate change is headed in the future? Working group two is impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, and you can think of that basically as the consequences of climate change. Uh, you know, the climate change has been happening historically, and and the risks going forward in the future. And then working group three is called mitigation of climate change. And that's basically uh, solutions. Uh, so you can think of these working groups as these three working groups as covering causes, consequences, and solutions gotcha. for climate change. And so- What a uh, crazy concept of potentially naming those groups as what they are instead of working group uh, Yeah. One, well, two, like I said, the IPCC is a UN uh, entity. Uh, it's it's a, yeah, it goes, it goes back a lot of years, but the, you know, these reports, there actually have been three reports in this cycle. Uh, so going back to uh, summer of 2021, working group one had uh, its report in the, the sixth assessment round. Uh, then in February, working group two had its report and then, then just this recent release for working group three. So in the last six months or so, we've basically had the latest update on causes, consequences, and solutions of climate change. Gotcha. And before we dive into this, this feels like a conversation that I'll be drinking for. Noah's not drinking. That's okay. We support that. However, while we talk about how the world is burning, I'm going to be having a beer. Once again, having my Bel Air Sour from Brooklyn. Was it Brooklyn Brewery? Delicious. Tastes. Burns a little bit going down, which is how this news feels. So anyways, <laughs> let's dive into it. So you mentioned that the recent science had been out for a little bit while, but kind of solutions and how dire the situation has been was very much directly released to the public in April recently. Obviously, this has been news that's been going on for so, so long that scientists are all like, you guys are idiots. We've been telling you this for years and years and years. But could you give us just a brief summary of what this report said and why it's so dire? One of the features of, of the IPCC reports is that uh, they can't have anything new in them. Uh, so it, it's an interesting feature that uh, these, I mean, they just, they assess just thousands of papers, they get thousands of review comments, there's hundreds and hundreds of authors involved. And the real power of it is assessing what's been published, you know, essentially since the last cycle. So I was the, the round that I was an author on, you know, those, those came out in 2013 and 2014. Gotcha. Right, so it's been now, you know, almost a decade, uh, a little less than a decade. So that's a lot of of new science that's that's been released. And you know, the real power, as I say, is in having all of those experts look across all of the evidence. Um, and so, you know, what's even more clear now is is uh, not only that climate change is happening, uh, and not only that humans are. Uh, the driver of that climate change, particularly our, our fossil fuel emissions, but also that climate change that's happening is already having impacts. 
right? So we're already being impacted, uh, you know, people and ecosystems. Um, this is costing us. It's costing us financially. We have a lot of evidence uh, in the last few years quantifying those financial costs. And it's also impacting us in a lot of other ways that that aren't aren't monetary. And the you know the window is still open to uh, reduce our emissions sufficiently to stabilize the climate system. Um, you know within the UN Paris Agreement yes. thresholds, right? So this you know, you've probably heard about this 1.5 degree and two degree goal, the, the countdown clock uh, that you see in in different cities that. That's the countdown clock to those. Correct me um, if we're wrong, if I'm wrong, but we're at 1.1 already, right? Yeah, so we're 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 now uh, up to the 1.1 threshold. We're oh, great. we're moving past it. Um, awesome. The actual global warming is moving along at pretty much the rate that was predicted. Um, I will say that you know, for me personally, a decade ago, I was much more of a uh, you know, what we might call an adaptation optimist. Um, I had, I, you know, a decade ago, I would have expressed m- more of a sanguine attitude about our ability to adapt to a changing climate. Now it's clear that uh, we're, you know, the, the gap is widening, right? The climate is changing faster than we're able to keep up with. And that means we're we're already experiencing severe impacts. And that means that the window to you know, stabilize the climate system uh, to minimize those impacts is is closing rapidly. So what is this window that we have? Well, so that question is really relative to time for what? Right? Okay. Uh, if we go back in history a bit, Copenhagen International UN Climate Conference, which was in 2009, that set a marker of a two degrees of global warming above the pre-industrial baseline. And as you say, we're now above one degree, we're, you know, we're, we're pushing past 1.1. And you know, sort of more than halfway to two is the, is the point. And uh, the Paris Agreement followed in 2015, and that was a really big marker in terms of the international ambition because it articulated the goal of holding global warming not to two degrees, but actually well below two degrees and critically pursuing 1.5 degrees. So a lot of that uh, clock that you hear about is that 1.5 degrees target from the Paris Agreement. And it's really, you know, how much fossil fuels do we emit every year? And what's the relationship between the greenhouse gas emissions and the global warming? And, And there's a pretty linear relationship between the total amount of greenhouse gases that humans emit and the rate of global warming. And uh, that's basically where that timeline comes from. So when you hear there's 12 years left and things like that, that's, that's where that's coming from. Gotcha. What did the uh, IPCC report say in regards of timing before we reach 1.5? So at the current rate of global warming, um, it looks like we'll reach 1.5 in the early 2030s. And that's for the long term mean. Uh, But the IPCC report says essentially that you know, by 2030, then we can expect, you know, about a 50% probability of any given year being 1.5 degrees warmer at the global scale than the pre-industrial. Now, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, if I asked you today, how much is the global mean, what's the global mean temperature relative to the pre-industrial, you know, none of us, including climate scientists, would have any intuition Right. about that. And that's, we, we don't live in the global mean on any day. Uh, you know, we, we certainly don't, uh, you know, it's not the global mean temperature that we really experience. And, you know, one of the clearest pieces of evidence in the last decade is that global warming is already intensifying the kinds of conditions that really matter for people and other living things, the heat waves and the floods and the droughts and the, and the wildfires, storm surge flooding from, from tropical storms. These are all areas where we have now very clear evidence that, that, global warming is already having an impact and that it's already uh, costing us. Right. And you mentioned that there is a significant monetary cost to global warming. Do you have a number for that? Yeah. So we have a lot of numbers for that. Yeah. Uh, so I give you, I can, I <laughs> can give science-y. you a, this is, a few. This is a place to I can nerd give you out. a few. Yeah. So, um, so from my research that I've conducted with collaborators, uh, I can give you a few numbers. If we look at those UN Paris Agreement goals, so the two degrees of global warming and the 1.5 degrees of global warming, it's going to cost more. It's going to be harder to hold global warming to 1.5 than it is to hold it to two. Um, And it's going to be harder and cost more to hold it to two 
than 2.5 or 3 or 4, right? Like the, you know, it actually will require uh, investment to, to right. for that energy transition. So one of the questions we've asked is, you know, what's the other side of the ledger? What are the financial and economic impacts that are avoided from those lower levels of global warming? So if we, if we look, for example, at, at 1.5 degrees relative to 2 degrees, it's actually, you know, potentially trillions of dollars of difference in terms of the economic growth that the, the, the impacts on economic growth. So if we do nothing, if yep. we make no investment, we'll get a lot of global warming, right? Uh, we're, we're at, we're at 1.1 degrees now, you know, by the end of the 20th century, we can expect, you know, say four degrees Celsius of, of global warming. If we don't do anything, no policies, no investment, just, you know, per capita energy use scaled over, over the whole world, you know, the, something like the U S per capita energy use scaled over the whole world will give us a lot of global warming. Um, which is bad <laughs> for people well, who are listening. Well, it depends well who... yeah, it's, it's a different, it's a different yeah. world. So I want to be clear, there are costs to the energy transition, right? Like it, right. it requires, um, you know, if I'm going to retire my minivan and replace it with an EV and purchase solar panels to charge my EV, that's going to cost me money. And you add all that up, right. all the upgrades to the grid, et cetera, et cetera. Like it, it will cost, but there are also benefits. Right, and there are benefits in uh, cleaner air um, locally. There are benefits in, um, you know, in some cases actually lower energy costs, right. uh, you know, fr from those alternatives. And there are benefits in the avoided climate change. Right. And so, if we look at what's happened historically, we find actually that countries that are already warm tend to have their per capita GDP grows a bit slower in warmer years than in cooler years. Huh. And, and actually, there are very large populations around the world that live in countries that are, you know, that, that have, this, have this drag on their economic growth uh, in warm years. So we know that global warming has already exacerbated economic inequality from Marshall Burke, uh, who's a collaborator of mine, and, and, and the work that we've done together. We estimate that global economic inequality is about 25 to 40 percent larger today than it would wow. have been without global warming. That's wow. mostly because of this lower rate of per capita GDP growth in countries that are already warm, large populations, large impoverished populations. So we're already experiencing that economic impact. So uh, why here, is, can I ask, why is there that correlation? Yeah. So there's, uh, if you think about the building blocks of GDP, right? So GDP is, you know, the total economic activity, as, as, as Marshall says, it's the amount of stuff that gets produced, right? Amount of goods right. and services that get produced. So if you think about the building blocks, labor, productivity, agriculture, there's a lot of evidence that these actually are impacted by hotter conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, some examples, you know, there are very steep declines in agricultural yields when it's very hot. Uh, there are declines in labor productivity when it's very hot. There's a lot of experimental evidence that shows that people, you know, caught, there's a cognitive decline when it's hot. There's more workplace injuries right. when it's hot. Um, drivers actually honk more uh, when it's hot. Baseball batter, baseball pitchers are more likely to hit uh, batters. Um, you know, so there's more interpersonal violence on the baseball field. Uh, when I mean, it's I hot. get so it. When I start sweating, like no one's safe. So yeah. So there's, <laughs> so there's actually a lot of evidence that, that these hot conditions, um, you know, are a drag on on the the what ends up building the, being the building blocks of those that economic right. activity. And now there's evidence both looking either way, top down or bottom up, as the economists say. This effect is is pretty clear. These small effects, small annual effects, can become very large differences. So, you know, in our calculation, for example, India, the per capita GDP is around 30 percent lower today than it would have been without global warming. Nigeria, similarly, uh, about 30 percent. Uh, Brazil, about 25 percent. So these are these, you know, cumulatively, these end up being large impacts. Right. That's massive. We're also experiencing, you know, increasing frequency of extreme events. So in, in countries like the U.S., for example, you know, in, in separate studies, we found that you know, the, the costs of flooding, which are billions of dollars a year, about a third of, of the costs 
in the last three decades have been contributed by intensifying precipitation, right? So we're already paying out, you know, on the order of a billion dollars a year in climate damages just in flooding right. uh, that, we're, that we're bearing. Similarly for um, crop insurance, you know, the U.S. crop insurance program, we calculate, you know, about 20% of the, of the cost to U.S. taxpayers uh, in the last three decades have been contributed by you know, long-term warming, you know, increasing frequency of hot events. So there's a lot of evidence, a lot of different lines of evidence that climate change is already costing uh, Very both wealthy expensive. countries and poor countries. Yeah. yeah, this is just a bad investment, folks. For people who are like, it's too expensive to revert away from coal. You're stupid. It's already expensive. well. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, that that what is is it too expensive or not? You know, is it that to answer that question, you really have to look at both sides of the ledger, right? You have to look at you know, if you're going to do a cost benefit analysis um, and argue for or for any policy action or against any policy action based on cost benefit, then it, then of course it's important to do the full costs and the full benefits in that calculation. But I will also add that one of the costs of not doing anything for global warming is death, which feels like a big one, you know? Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly, um, <laughs> Just to put the it kinds into of extreme terms. events that, you know, that are high risk for people that are are, are increasing, they're increasing in frequency and, and intensity, and, and we have clear evidence that um, global warming is playing a role. So yeah, I'm, I'm probably a bit more conservative in my articulation of that statement, but which is so um, fair. certainly the risks are rising. Yes. No, you're a scientist and I'm a, just a fellow drinking a beer. So <laughs> you have to be conservative in that statement. And I appreciate, and I appreciate it. The report came out that we're getting hot. We're getting very, very warm um, and in not a fun way. It's really tied to fossil fuels. How do we, what type of energy alternatives are there? How are investments going? How do we spur this type of rise in these alternate forms of? So, you know, one of the one of the key findings in the most recent IPCC report is that the cost of alternative energy is has been going down uh, in you know for many alternatives and in many parts of the world. So, even compared to you know a decade or so ago, price of solar, price of wind, uh, price of batteries have fallen substantially and the the share of the portfolio for each of those has risen as well. Grid is a big uh, part of that transition, right? Having a grid that can handle essentially uh, the, you know, that renewable and renewables and the, the intermittency of renewables. And then a key component is uh, storage as well, right? Because the sun does not shine everywhere all the time. The wind does not blow everywhere all the time. And so storage, energy storage, you know, batteries, for example, um, heat pumps, uh, other technologies, those are really critical for having an energy system that um, can be net zero. And then, of course, efficiency matters as well. So as uh, Steve Chu, who's a you know, Stanford colleague and perhaps more importantly was Secretary of Energy, um, you know, Steve Chu often says, you know, the, the cheapest kilowatt is the one that you don't use at all. And so, you know, it's a combination of, of how you know, consumption, how much we do use, and then what the source of the energy that we do use, you know, where that's coming from. And what electrification gives is the ability to use, you know, different non-fossil fuel sources at different times when they're available and to, uh, you know, have the flexibility and so net zero is net zero carbon emissions. Correct. Yeah. Sorry about the jargon. Um, no, all good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So net zero, net zero, if you think about, you know, how much we emit across the whole world and you know, the fossil fuel CO2 emissions um, prior to the pandemic were, you know, around 37 billion tons of CO2. That's just the CO2. And then you've got the methane and the N2O and the... Um, fluorinated gases and all of that on top of that, right? That's just a lot of tons. And, yeah. um, you know, in the pandemic, you know, the pandemic, you know, we, we had a massive, massive austerity um, across the world in terms of people staying home for, for health reasons, right? To, to manage the pandemic, we had all those lockdowns. 2020, we had a you know, about a five and a half percent reduction in fossil fuel CO2 emissions in 2020. And then in 2021, it bounced back pretty close to 2019 levels. So we're pretty much back to where, and actually in, in 2022 now, 
uh, and we're pretty much back to pre-pandemic levels of emissions. Yeah, so if you think about, I mean, here's the back of the envelope number for you. You're talking, you're asking about um, how long do we have left and how, you know, what reaching net zero, how, you know, how rapidly do we have to do that? We would have to reduce global emissions by about 7% per year, year after year, and reach net zero emissions around 2050 to have a pretty solid chance of meeting that 1.5 degree global warming target. So there's no country in the world that's ever done that. We're talking about the whole world doing 7% a year. There's no country in the world that's ever done that for one year with with continued, uh, you know, um, without a really big hope. recession, let's say. Um, <laughs> so just think about the pandemic. The pandemic, um, you know, about a five and a half percent reduction. Oh, uh, really? In in one year, right? So even twenty twenty, even all that austerity, and it was, was only less five and than, a half what we need yeah. to do. Yeah. So I, oh, cool, you know, cool, what cool. I say in class frequently is my conclusion from that is that we are not going to do that to decarbonize the energy system and reach net zero and hold the global warming to 1.5 degrees through austerity right it is not awesome not going to do it through austerity because we did a lot of austerity during the pandemic and yeah uh, that that was not even I mean, enough. one year of seven percent reductions which is crazy all right cool, cool 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 so two questions for you feel free to answer which one you ever want first one is questions about hydrogen and nuclear power and whether those are good alternatives because those are frequent buzzwords and people seem to be excited about those. And I find them very interesting. Other thing is the concept of net zero, I find very interesting because it feels like it still puts a lot of, it puts a lot of pressure on the individual to make those small changes, but not a lot on corporation in my personal opinion, because there is, you can do carbon credit trading and stuff like that and still reach net zero. Go. Yeah, so let's start with the net zero. <laughs> yes. Uh, cuz I yeah, I haven't really defined that. Um but if you think about so think about like if your bank account is net zero, what does that mean? It means that what you deposit into the bank account is equal to what you draw out. out of it. Which and is something I'm trying not to do personally is in my zero. bank account. <laughs> um yeah, so right now we're 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 depositing a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Right? We're we're emitting a lot more than we take out of the atmosphere. And as a result, you know, the concentrations are increasing. We know, you know, really really clearly from, you know, the just the fundamental physics of planet earth and frankly of other planets as well i mean just the, the the laws of physics are such that as long as we are emitting greenhouse gases to the atmosphere we're going to keep having continued global warming and continued climate change so you know net zero has become a a policy goal it's become perhaps even a political and marketing buzzword but the reality is is it's it's just about the physics of the planetary energy balance and and just the basic arithmetic of emissions, right? So all, net, net zero is at its core apolitical, right? It's just that the reality of the physics of the planet are such that stabilizing the global temperature requires reaching net zero emissions. Now, where some of the controversy might come from is that to get net zero of anything, right, if you're able to draw out as much as you put in, then you're at net zero. So that's where the concept of these carbon credits or, or offsets comes from. So in some policy, some actual policies that are in place around the world, entities can offset some of their emissions by paying someone else not to emit or paying someone else to sequester, right? So in, you know, funding a, a hydroelectric project or, you know, funding forest-based carbon sequestration, agriculture-based carbon sequestration, right? These are these are some of the, the offsets and we as individuals can do it. You know, you can, you know, when you buy a plane ticket, you can, you know, for some airlines, you can click a button to pay extra for, for carbon offsets. So the reality is that the, the whole world is offsetting, right, in the atmosphere. The atmosphere actually doesn't care where the, where the CO2 came from, right? So, right. so the net zero part, you know, to be globally net zero, then everything that, that's getting emitted has to be offset 
a hundred percent basically. Uh, so that requires a lot of negative emissions, uh, given where we're at now with our, with our positive emissions. What I find personally frustrating is sometimes some massive corporations that input extreme amounts of CO2 uh, into the atmosphere and are massive contributors to pollution will buy these carbon credits so that technically they're like meeting the limits that they have to under the EPA and whatnot, but they're not actually taking the sustainability steps needed in order for like sustainable action in limiting their CO2 production. Yeah. And some of those are, some of those are voluntary and some of those are, you know, have a are within a policy framework. So here in California, we have a cap and trade, right? It's called, right. you know, AB 32. It's a law. You know, firms, in order to emit, they have to either stay within their allowance or they have to buy pollution credits from some other source. What that means is that the government sets the total amount of pollution and then the market decides what the price of the right to pollute is. And the market decides where the pollution happens. And there are some big environmental justice implications, certainly for the spatial component of that, right? Like the, like the market deciding where the pollution happens. We have pretty clear evidence that that you know, tends to get concentrated in, in poor and marginalized communities. And I, I mean, I remember, I remember as an undergrad first learning about cap and trade as a policy, you know, it's in an environmental economics class. And like, I remember having you know, a really strong visceral reaction to the concept of buying the right to pollute. Right. Like right. It's it's uh, and I think that's some of what you're getting at. <laughs> uh, sounds like what you're articulating as well. Um, there's there's basically command and control policies and there's market based policies. So the government can say you can't do that, and we have all kinds of experience with with command and control policies. You know, lead lead's not allowed in gasoline, etc. Right. So there's we we have a lot of uh, of experience with with command and control policies. And then we have we have experience with market based policies as well, and this cap and trade that I just described is one of them. A tax, um, which uh, you know has been proposed for greenhouse gases um, in in the U.S. has been proposed, is not enacted. Um, you know that puts a price on the activity, and then you know the market basically decides the amount. So the response to to the reaction you're having is either well the government can say we're not you know no one can do any of that the government can say you can only do this much the government can put in a market based policy either a, either a tax or a cap and trade type mechanism or the government can try to incentivize you know people and and firms to do something different through subsidies through other right. incentives right that are not binding limits um and we have a lot of examples of those being tried in different ways in different places. Let's also dive into the concept of hydrogen power and nuclear power. This is mainly for me because I find it really interesting and I still don't really entirely understand what exactly goes. I just know that chemistry happens and things go boom and then energy works. So are these, <laughs> are they better than natural renewable energy? And like, where do they lie? Why is so much money being poured behind these innovations? Yeah, so if you think of the broad scale, so I'll, I'll tell you what I tell you know, my students at the beginning of each quarter, like in, you know, for a undergrad entering college now, over their adult lifetime, the, from a climate perspective, right, there's, there's really three grand challenges that are intertwined. One is that we don't supply enough energy for the whole world, right, to have the energy that's needed for human well-being. Uh, right now, right? We're not supplying enough energy right now, and we're certainly not supplying it equitably, right? So the difference between how much energy I have access to and how much energy I use and the billion plus people that don't have access to electricity, the you know, one to two billion people that don't have access to clean water, you know, depending on how clean uh, you're, right. you're talking Standards about, yeah. Uh, yeah, don't have access to transportation, et cetera, et cetera, right? The, the, the fundamental energy resources that are, that are needed for a basic level of human well-being, you know, there are billions of people that are in energy poverty, and that's a, that's a huge barrier to human development. So we're not supplying enough energy globally now. Uh, and we're not supplying it. You know, the problem's even worse from an equity perspective. Challenge number one is supplying enough energy. Depending on how you do the calculation, uh, you know, it, you know, you'll see numbers that are, you know, two to three times uh, the total energy that we supply now, plus more equitably, right? Then, if you're interested in stabilizing the climate system, that's going to require reaching net zero emissions, right? Like as I said earlier, that's just the fundamental physics of 
of planet Earth. So if you're talking about doubling the amount of energy that we supply in a global energy system that's more than 80% fossil fuels, so doubling the amount of energy we supply, maybe even tripling it, while also reaching net zero, right? Doing it would be it would be a super duper challenge to decarbonize our current energy system, and just you know continue to supply 600 exajoules a year. But double that while also reaching net zero, huge challenge. Right. And then we're definitely going to have more climate change than we've already had. Right. right. I mean, it, it is going to be very, very, very hard. Even if we have 1.5, that's right more global warming than we've already had. That's more climate change than we've already had. We're not adapted to the 1.1 degrees C that we've already had. It's yeah. costing us yeah. uh, huge amounts of money. It's costing um, humans zero, huge other nature impacts. one. <laughs> yeah, so so now that's, that's you know, a grand, adapting to 1.1 degrees C of warming is a grand challenge. Adapting to 1.5 or two or three, um, you know, if the Paris goals aren't met, you know, that's, um, that's another very large grand challenge. So all three of those are intertwined and all three of those are, um, you can't avoid any of those in terms of, um, you know, managing climate risk. So, so how do you increase energy supply and access while also decarbonizing the energy system? Well, you could do it with fossil fuels plus carbon capture and sequestration. That's one option. None of this is done at scale yet, by the way, right? So you either either continue to use fossil fuels and, and keep the CO2 from making it into the atmosphere and capture it and store it somewhere, or you need alternatives to fossil fuels at a huge scale, or you need both, right? And, and the reality is, is that if there's a chance at all of of reaching net zero emissions. It's gonna come from a combination of, of, all of them. Right. different solutions, right? Combination of um, scaling, you know, the kinds of wind and solar projects that were already that are already increasing but are not nearly at the scale that are needed for a global energy system that's net zero. The combination of, of that plus new kinds of non-fossil fuel energy sources. Um, nuclear is obviously not new, but also not at the scale to supply the whole world. Hydrogen, you know, would be new, is not at scale now. Uh, you know, could be part of an all of the above solution. And then the carbon capture and sequestration from, you know, from fossil fuel energy is is being trialed now. You know, it isn't, there are demonstration plants. But really, you know, if you think about, we're talking about gigatons, billions of tons, you know, dozens of billions of tons of CO2 emissions at present. Right. So to reach net zero, we need dozens of billions of tons of avoided emissions, right? Of right. abatement, right? You've got to, um, so that means new energy sources at scale that are, that don't emit and ways to capture emissions from the emitting energy sources. And then, you know, ways to, to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere at scale. So we're not going to get to net zero without all of those. I know this is so unscientific, but for some reason, this is just the image in my mind of like carbon capture and like sequestering it. You know, in Night at the Museum, where Owen Wilson is the little mini cowboy. I do <laughs> actually know that. <laughs> I actually do have firsthand experience of that reference on the screen. Yes. <laughs> some reason in my mind it's him on a tiny as a tiny little cowboy just like whipping a lasso around like getting all the co2 out and it just makes the concept of this so much better just bring that I, I, concept I, I think, up to your scientist friends see if that's a possibility and i think the world would be in a much better place i'll try i'll try that at the next conference yeah, yeah. Uh, over zoom in a breakout room no doubt um so where do we go from here also you probably have a more accurate information but from my understanding north america and europe and china are some of the biggest polluters as i was saying earlier you know that the the change in the global temperature the global warming is proportional to the total cumulative emissions added all up. i mean this is just carbon has a long lifetime in the atmosphere um, the heat is trapped by those greenhouse gases, is stored in the climate system for centuries. So really, when we talk about who's emitted what, it's really who's emitted what historically. So uh, the U.S. is about 25% of the total historical emissions. Uh, the EU, including the U.K., uh, is a less than that, uh, but more than 20%. 
So, you know, it's a little less than half for the U.S. plus the EU plus U.K. China's been the largest country level emissions in recent years, but uh, cumulatively, you know, they're much less than the U.S., you know, so less than half. Uh, or so, call it America. Call it about half, we don't have to be number. US. Yeah, we don't have to be number one in everything. It's okay, guys. <laughs> We're number one in historical emissions, uh, yeah. cumulatively, uh, and All then right. also critically per capita emissions. Right. So the the you know if you're talking about net zero emissions globally, you're talking about the whole global population. U.S. is you know double. EU and China per capita are pretty similar, and we're you know, on the order of double there you yeah. know, on the annual basis. So the responsibility is a, you know, it, it's a key part of the policy discussion for sure, both domestically and internationally. Um, but when we talk about, you know, how much emissions have come from where, uh, it's really important. It's really important to keep in mind that number one, it's the cumulative emissions that matter for the climate system. Number two, it's per capita emissions that really matter if we're thinking about how to get to net zero. Number three, we move a lot of carbon around the world in in terms of you know where the emissions happen and then where the goods and services are used. So I'm like sitting in the in a room with a whole bunch of electronics that I'm using, but the you know the emissions to manufacture went up into the atmosphere somewhere else. Like I'm responsible right. for the emissions, right? I, my demand that led to the construction of the iPhone, um, not all the iPhones, but the one that <laughs> I have, right? So, you know, consumption, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of emissions that are embodied in, in trade, so to speak. And then lastly, you know, the economic development and, and human well-being are very closely tied to energy use and that energy use has mostly been fossil fuel based uh, for most of the industrial era. And China, India, Indonesia, they're all, um, you know, they're, they're all developing on a more carbon efficient trajectory than we did, right? So if we, if we look at per capita emissions and we look at per capita GDP, China's actually, you know, for, for China's per capita GDP, it's per capita emissions are actually much lower than the US or, or Western Europe at the same emissions per capita GDP. You know, I'm not saying that any country is, is better or worse than any other one. Uh, the bottom line is that the you know, the atmosphere responds to all the all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, yeah. you know, independent of where they came from. And reaching that zero globally is a is a really big challenge. It's 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 not an impossible challenge, but it's it's a big one. Where do we go from here? And also a fun point to notice that I was just like, hmm, irony. Biden released is releasing over one million barrels of crude oil per day for like the next six months. The IPCC report was released a couple days after that. And then for uh, Earth Day, he signed something. He was like, we need to stop forest fires, which is great and important. However, the IPCC report was like, hey, bro, it's all fossil fuel. Not all, but a lot of it is fossil fuels. And then he's like, but forest. So that's just something I wanted to put out there. Um, anyways, <laughs> where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean, I think those, I think those three grand challenges, you know, are really, you know, um, you know, they don't, they don't encompass all of the, everything that humanity has to deal with. But from a climate perspective, they're, they're, you know, pretty good lampposts. We actually need to supply more energy than we do now. And we need to supply it much more equitably to ensure human well-being for all people on planet Earth. To stabilize the climate system, we need to decarbonize the energy system and reach net zero emissions. We're not going to stabilize the climate system by until, well, well, depending on depending on what level uh, you're stabilizing at for lower levels of warming, it's going to have to happen Way faster. Sooner. So for a pretty good chance of getting to 1.5, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to reach net zero by 2050. Uh, for a pretty good chance of of staying below two, or we'd have to reach net zero by 2070, and both of those will require negative emissions after that. Right. Uh, we're going to get more climate change than we've already had, and where do we go from here? We're going to have to adapt. Uh, and, and we're actually getting further behind year after year. The gap between what we're dealing with in terms of climate extremes and what we're what we're prepared for is is getting bigger and bigger each year. The, the, the impacts are are accelerating, costs are accelerating. Uh, so where do we go from here? We need to supply more energy more equitably. We need to you know, to reach net zero emissions. We we need to decarbonize the energy system, and we need to. Uh, catch up with the climate change that's already happened and and jump ahead to be prepared for the climate change that we're sure to get in the future. Cool. 
or could be cooler, some may say. <laughs> Uh, the global temperature is essentially uh, guaranteed not to be cooler. Awesome. The question is how much warmer. warmer. It's getting hot in here, and it's not fun. All right, folks. Anyways, Noah, it has been great having you on. Thank you so much for going all sciencey on us and giving us all the big picture about what's going on. Everyone needs to take tiny steps and then also apply pressure to your government and be like, yo, this shit's not cool. You need to make sure people are, we need to like get net zero because otherwise we're all going to die. Um, that's not what Noah said, but that's what I'm paraphrasing. That's definitely not what I said. No, that's definitely did not, not what I said. This. That was not an evidence-based statement. <laughs> this is uh, me after a beer-based statement. So <laughs> take with that as you wish. Um, but I'm your host, Emily Gross. Thank you so much. We'll be back next week with another episode of Bureaucracy.